Hello, this video is going to be about environmental activism. Let's get started with what is happening before 1960, though, when we consider the environmental movement to begin in the 1960s. So we have the preservationists versus the conservationists that I might have mentioned previously when we were talking about the progressive era and how individuals like Teddy Roosevelt were very interested in conservation. So let's define those. Preservationists like John Muir, who took beautiful photographs of the Yosemite Valley and is probably most known for that, he wanted to protect nature for nature's sake, leaving large areas of the country unpopulated, undeveloped, and making sure that they were protected and making sure that trees could live for the sake of the trees. However, conservationists like Teddy Roosevelt, they also want to protect nature and they want to set aside land and all of that, but they want it for humans to be able to use, to consume, and to enjoy. And you'll recall that in the early 1900s, the national park system is created with all of these massive national areas of nature that are set aside. Then when we move into the New Deal, we have programs like the Civilian Conservation Corps that we previously talked about, where they planted three billion trees. And these young men were working to, not only were they trying to make money as part of a jobs program, but they were also doing a lot of things including making trails and all kinds of things that were related to nature. Um, then I just listed a couple other acts that were created in the 1940s and 50s to show you that there was some things, although they didn't get much traction and not a lot was going on. So we had the Bald Eagle Protection Act of 1940. The Nature Conservancy was created in 1951 and there was an Air Pollution Control Act in 1955. However, it mo mostly gave the control of regulating it to the states. And so it wasn't really a national effort as much as we're going to see later. So how did the environmental movement begin? There's two really big events that you should probably mark as the, the beginning. One is in the 1960s. And this woman, Rachel Carson, she wrote a book in which it was called Silent Spring. And it was written in 1962. And she's considered the beginning of the modern environmental movement. And We've talked previously about how there's just certain books that have massive impacts on changing the way people think about things and on society. And we talked about how the jungle was one of those during the progressive era and major made major changes in meatpacking. Well, Silent Spring is one of those. And she was really concerned over a pesticide called DDT and the consequences it would bring to the birds and the fish. And I have a couple of quotes in just a second here. In 1972, after she died, sadly, the D DDT was officially banned in the United States, and it was largely because of her efforts through this book, and really is a watershed moment in raising public awareness of the need to protect the environment, not just for the environment's sake, but also the potential consequences it can have on human beings. And it sold over 500,000 copies in 24 different countries. So let's look at a couple of quotes. The first one she says is the most alarming of all man's assault upon the environment is the contamination of air, earth, rivers, and sea with dangerous and even lethal materials. This pollution is for the most part irrecoverable. The chain of evil that it initiates not only in the world that must support life, but in living tissues is for the most part irreversible. It is now it, in this now universal contamination of the environment. Chemicals are the sinister and little recognized partners of radiation in changing the very nature of the world, the very nature of its life. And these sprays, dusts, and aerosols are now applied almost universally to farms, gardens, forests, and homes, non-selective chemicals that have the power to kill every insect, the good and the bad, to still the song of the birds and the leaping of fish in the streams, to coat the leaves with a deadly film and to linger on in its soil. All this through the intended target, though the intended target may be only a few weeds or insects. Can anyone believe it is possible to lay down such a barrage of poisons on the surface of the earth without making it fit for all life? So you can see here why she called it Silent Spring, because she was talking about how there would be no more song from the birds or leaving a fish in the streams, etc. And so this book was very important. Now, the concerns of the environmental movement in the 1970s included industrialization. Factories caused not only pollution, but they dumped hazardous waste. And you're going to see some events that we're going to talk about in the next couple of slides. Also, surface mining was a, was a problem for the environment. In the 1800s, they used to mine underground, but they're going to move into surface mining. And this picture that you see next to this is called Berkeley Pit. And it's a surface mine that is in Butte, Montana, that I had the opportunity to visit on a history 
feature trip that was all about mining and the impact of mining on the environment. And this is the most toxic water in North America and filled with just so many chemicals. And there was a story of how there was, I think it was snow geese that were coming. Uh, they were in their migration pattern and they stopped and they landed here and they all died because the chemicals were so bad. And it is something that we need to be aware of and that often is getting into conflict of what are the consequences of all this. We have surface mining all over the place. All you have to do is drive up the 15 freeway and you can see multiple locations where the land has been stripped away and you don't see these normal mountains anymore or hills either. Also, air pollution was a problem. Smog had been a problem since the 1950s, but the air quality became much worse by the 1970s and will need to be addressed. Not just in the 70s, but after that as well. And it's not probably until the 90s, maybe even 2000s, that it becomes clearer. So even if you think there's smog and pollution today, it's nothing near where it was in the 1970s. Pesticides, as I previously mentioned, was a major problem. And then water pollution. Roughly two thirds of the nation's lakes and rivers were not safe for swimming or fishing for that matter due to pollution. So these are just a few of them. There's obviously more, but these are four that I came up with to focus on. So the other watershed moment kind of was Earth Day. It began in 1970. It has been held every April 22nd since then. So in 2021, it will be the 51st anniversary of Earth Day that that will be happening. Uh, Americans were consuming vast amounts of leaded gas. Smoke and sludge was created by industry and air pollution was strong. And there were growing concerns over pollution and the destruction of the natural environment. So Senator Nelson from Wisconsin, I don't know which political party he belongs to, witnessed the Santa Barbara oil spill that happened in 1969. And he also was looking at the fact that there were all these anti-war protests. And he wanted to do something and he figured he can use that same energy of the anti-war protests, but direct them towards concerns over water and air pollution. So he's going to recruit another member of Congress to help him and then eventually recruits this man by the name of Dennis Hayes, who he asked to create campus teach-ins, that should say. Hayes built a national staff of 85 people to promote events all across the country. And that first Earth Day had about 10% of the population involved or 20 million Americans that would participate. And it grew um, after that. And it is now in, in um, hundreds of countries around the world. Um, in 1990s is when it became more global and it reaches billions of people each year, uh, whether they plant trees or they recycle or they do something. Uh, but it all came from this idea of a teach-in caused by this senator was, um, from Wisconsin. Now, what are some of the major events that caused the activism to occur? Well, one of them was what happened at Love Canal. And Love Canal was a community in Niagara Falls, New York. It had been built in the 1890s as a model community and had no problems. Uh, but eventually the Hooker Chemical Company bought some of this land and it dumped with permission from the city of Niagara Falls, it dumped toxic waste into a land um, into a landfill beginning in 1942. It's kind of a canal zone that they created as a landfill. The canal became a 16 acre landfill and in 10 years it dumped almost 22,000 tons of chemicals. In 1952, the Niagara Falls School District was needed more land, it was growing. And so they decided to purchase the land and began construction, which led to breach contaminant structures. So they had, the, the company had created these things to keep it from contaminating and from, from leaking out. But as the school district is doing construction, it creates these little holes that are allowing the chemicals now to seep out. So had they not purchased the land and done construction, it might've been perfectly fine. But by the 1970s, so two decades later, residents who really may not have even known that it was built on a landfill, uh, began to notice odors and fluids, black sludge in the yard, and then they had the problem where residents became sick. And this included numerous babies born with defects. And a woman by the name of Lois Gibbs, who was a mother of two, she went on a crusade beginning in 1978. And she gathered together people to form a, a, a homeowners community association. And she went up against the federal government and eventually she did convince them to relocate 800 families and they were reimbursed for the loss of their homes. There will be an act that I will talk about later created in 1980 called Superfund that helps clean up the area and cleanup finally ended in 2004. And there have been some people allowed to return to the area and purchase new homes, renovate new homes. But we're going to hear briefly from Lois Gibbs. We worked with a scientist from Roswell Institute. This is a cancer research 
um, Institute in Buffalo. Dr. Beverly Pagan agreed to work with us because we thought, we truly believed, if we can prove that there is an increase in disease, they, meaning the government, will do the right thing. And so we did this health study of the residents outside of the fence. So the residents who were most affected by Love Canal weren't even included in the study because they had already moved. So we looked at the families outside the fence, and we found that 56% of the children in our community were born with birth defects. 56% of our children had three ears, double rows of teeth, extra fingers, extra toes, or were mentally retarded. During that study time, there were, <clears throat> there were 22 women who were pregnant, and of those 22 pregnancies, only four normal babies were born. The rest of those pregnancies ended in miscarriages, stillborn babies, like Julie Ritten, or birth defected children. We looked at kidney disease, can we looked at all these things, and we presented it to the health department. We said, look, this is what we found. We believe that these are related to Love Canal, and therefore, you need to help us financially to get out of Love Canal. And the health department literally threw the health study on the floor. I mean, literally took it and just threw it on the floor and said, it's useless housewife data collected by people who have a vested interest in the outcome. Like their studies, they don't have any vested interest in the outcome, which is why the tissue samples continually got lost. And, and so in our stubbornness and Irishness, we picked it up and put it back on the table and said, you will read it. You will look at the study, and you will see that there is a connection. And through a bunch of organizing, we finally did get the New York State Department of Health to look at the study, to look at the community, to do their own study. And they came to Love Canal to announce their study results. This was another one of those very hysterical, chaotic, emotional meetings. They, they called me up in advance, the health department, and said that, they, that I would be amazed how close their results are to my results. And I'm like, no, I'm not. I live with these people. I know what's going on. We didn't make that stuff up. And they said, well, you'd be amazed, so we're coming out. So that evening, they had an evening meeting, 600 people, 550, 600 people in the audience. Everybody, I mean, just waiting. I mean, just quiet waiting. It was like... It was almost like being at a, at a funeral. It was just, you know, kind of sad and depressing and quiet. And, and so um, the health commissioner took the stage and said, we completed a study and talked about all of, the, all of the way they did the study, the methodology and all of that kind of stuff. He said, and this is what we found. We found that 56% of the children in Love Canal were born with birth defects. And we're secretly as sick as it sounds, saying, yes, yes, and now you're going to evacuate us, right? I mean, that's, that's what we're hoping for. And then he says, but we don't believe those birth defects are related to Love Canal. And it's just the whole audience you could hear, huh? I mean, it was just like, and it's like, we believe that those birth defects are related to a random clustering of genetically defective people. All right, our next incident is at Three Mile Island. At 4 a.m. on March 28, 1979, a pressure valve in the Unit 2 reactor failed to close. Cooling water contaminated with radiation drained into other buildings and the core began to overheat. Well, the operators didn't really know exactly what was going on. They misread the readings and they did what they shouldn't have done, which was to shut off the emergency water system. They will eventually figure it out that that's what they need to do is turn the water back on. But by the early morning, the core was over 4,000 degrees, and it was just 1,000 degrees from a meltdown. Uh, and so panic ensued as word spread about the fact that there was a leak that was discovered two days later. This was in an area in Pennsylvania. And so the word got out that within a five mile radius was all in danger. And so people fled and plant workers were exposed to some radiation. However, no one outside of the actual Three Mile Island was affected. The, when once people, realized that the reactor was contained and everything was okay, it still greatly eroded public faith in nuclear power. And we have not created any nu new nuclear reactors since then in the United States. So it basically shut down the idea of safe nuclear energy. 
air pollution. I mentioned smog previously. So it became a problem in the 1950s, and by 1963 had become a national problem. This is a picture of downtown Los Angeles in the, sometime probably in the 1970s. And in the 1970s, you could be in Pasadena, which is fairly close. There's hills right there, uh, beautiful mountains right there. And there were days that you literally couldn't see them. And they're just a few miles away. And you couldn't see them because the air was so bad. And at schools, they would have they would have smog alert days. And at schools, this meant there were no sports, no recess or anything. But it was just not safe to go outside. And it was frankly very disgusting, as you can see here. And so in 1970, the Clean Air Act was passed um, that was going to make major changes to this. Um, and the first national emission standards for cars um, were created through this and it's we now have 98 percent cleaner air than in the 1960s also the environmental protection agency which i'm going to talk about a little later began to phase out lead and gasoline and it was fully prohibited by 1995 so the fuels that we have now are much cleaner than prior to regulation and as we know uh, there are smog checks that have to be done on older cars uh, in california we have some of the cleanest vehicles and oftentimes, if you bring a car from another state, they will require you to have a special smog checkup to make sure that it's okay because we have such high standards in California. Water pollution was another problem. So the picture here is from 1969, I believe. And it was when the Cuyahoga River caught on fire because of oil that had been in it. Oh, 1969, I have it listed there at the bottom. And it caused $50,000 worth of damage to railroads bridges that were right next to it. It kind of cut off in this picture. The reality was this wasn't the first fire that had happened there. And it honestly didn't cause much interest at all. It wasn't until 1970, after Earth Day, that suddenly the nation woke up and said, oh my gosh, this is the consequences of industrial pollution and we must do something about it. So the first ma major law to address water pollution, however, had been in 1948 and was amended in 1972 as the Clean Water Act, which is the one that you need to be familiar with um, the most. And in the early 1970s, as I previously mentioned, roughly two thirds of the nation's lakes, rivers, and coastal areas were unsafe for fishing and swimming and untreated sewage was just dumped into open water. They thought nothing of it. And so there's been major efforts to cl clean the water and there's been amendments to the 1972 Clean Water Act since then as well. So here are a few of the components of the 1972 Clean Water Act. Um, including establishing basic structure for regulating pollutant discharges into waters. This is their words directly from the EPA site. Um, but you can see that EPA has the ability to implement pollution control programs. They're, they have quality standards for water. They made it unlawful for someone to put a pollutant into navigable waters unless there was a permit. Um, it funded the construction of sewage treatment plants, etc. So you don't need to be familiar with it. You just need to know that there was the Clean Water Act of this. What are some of the major acts that attempted to solve the problems? Well, we have the Environmental Protection Agency that's created in 1970, and it's done under President Nixon. So one of the things that is interesting is that both the Environmental Protection Agency, as well as Superfund, which is the cleanup efforts where the federal government spends money cleaning up, were both passed by Republican presidents. And so you may wonder, well, because of recent attacks, on um, and attempts to dismantle environmental protections, how is, why, where is the disconnect? Well, as I mentioned, environmentalism was very popular during the 1970s and Nixon was an opportunist. He saw this as a way to get young people perhaps to shift to vote for him in the 1972 election. And so it became one of his things um, that he wanted to do. Um, Reagan was the, architect of Superfund, and I'm not, I don't have quite as much information on why um, he would have done that one, um, although it was just very popular, you know, coming out of the 1970s, still this activism that was going on. Um, so the Environmental Protection Agency oversees the anything environmental that you can think of today. It is a very important one of our bureaucratic agencies that fit within the federal government. Then I already mentioned the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act. Um, that were passed. The, we also have the Endangered Species Act also passed under the Nixon administration, as well as the Marine Mammal Protection Act of 1973. You can kind of imagine what those are doing. Superfund, as I mentioned previously, is a clean to clean up, clean up toxic dumps. 
And I had the opportunity to visit a super fun site as part of my Montana trip. And it's a, now a golf course. And it had been in b very uh, bad shape as a result of anaconda copper smelting that had been done there. And they went in and they cleaned it up. And it is now a golf course that was designed by Jack Nicholas. So they can do amazing things with this super fund. So clearly it's very important that we have that. And then the last thing that is kind of environmental, but also deals with energy, since we're talking about nuclear energy, is the creation of the Department of Energy in 1977, which oversees um, things like that. What are the major concerns today with on which environmentalists focus? So there are other events that are going to happen, like the Exxon Valdez oil spill that's going to happen in 1989 in Alaska. Uh, we obviously had the Exxon BP oil spill that happened in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, so what are some of the major concerns? And there were more than this, such as obviously genetically modified foods is a, is a concern. But these are the four best ways to kind of sum up as many as I could, especially according to UN websites, as well as the Environmental Protection Agency. So one of them is waste. Oceans have become a giant waste dump for plastic. And the UN is estimating that the world population will be 8.5 billion in just nine years. So by 2030. And you can see in this picture here, this poor fish is caught in plastic. And when more people becomes more waste and we need to figure out how we're going to deal with it. So it doesn't just get dumped in the oceans. Severe weather is a problem. We are experiencing more frequent hurricanes, droughts, and heat waves. In addition, when you have this extreme heat and drought, this causes wildfires. And hurricanes and droughts and wildfires all displace people and animals both across the globe. And so this is a concern. Oil drilling and fracking debates range from where drilling should occur to how to transport it. Um, one of the big things that has uh, made the news is includes the Keystone Pipeline and fracking is obviously a big hotbed topic. In addition, concerns grow over accidents leading to spills and that's part of why the concerns over oil drilling and fracking exist. And then sustainability. The intensive food production that is needed to feed the number of people on this planet depletes the soil and it's becoming very challenging, plus overbreeding. Um, and that's why there's efforts for more people to eat fruits and vegetables and all that instead of eating meat. And then the growth of cities is also going to require new approaches to energy. So I'm not going to comment specifically on any of these um, or efforts related to those other than what I have. It's just, these are some of the issues today to show you the environmental movement did not just end in the 1970s and 1980 with the passage of Superfund, that it's continuing to go on to this day. And that's what I have for you. Thank you.